You'll note that since we have the panel open here and we're messing around inside, I have the tool unplugged for safety, but we can't do any more testing with it unplugged, so let me go plug it in. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Well, if you saw my video last week, you know that we wired up a buck transformer on this electromagnetic sheet metal brake. And uh, if you haven't seen that video, you might wanna go back and take a look at it. Uh, we're gonna talk about some stuff here that may make more sense if you've seen that video. One thing I need to correct is that I said that the connection wires on the transformer last week, I said they were aluminum. And it does indeed say wire AL right here on the nameplate. However, I've been corrected in the comments on that video that that wire AL refers to the windings in the coils of the transformer and not to the connection leads, and that the connection leads are indeed copper. So I pulled it apart, uh, did a little bit of scraping on those leads, and sure enough, they do appear to be tinned copper. So apparently, Jefferson makes both copper wound and aluminum wound transformers, I'm told and uh, this uh, marking on the nameplate just indicates that this one is wound with aluminum. It does not refer to the leads. So you don't need the uh, aluminum compound on the connections, though I don't think it's gonna hurt anything. The other thing that you'll note if you saw that video is that just for fun, I measured the current draw of the tool. And partly it was just because I wanted to make sure that my transformer was in spec and it was gonna be able to handle the load and I was trying to illustrate the current draw and the current flow in a buck transformer, but it didn't turn out as expected. The nameplate on this machine says it draws 10 amps. We measured 17 and a half RMS. That seems a little high. I contacted the manufacturer. They thought it seemed a little high, but after having me do some other tests, they didn't think anything was necessarily really wrong with it. Uh, but they decided they would just go ahead and ship me some replacement parts just in case and, uh, and asked me to swap those in and see if that made a difference. So I've spent the last week kind of diving in just because I'm curious. I couldn't figure out how this thing could be drawing so much more current than spec, where that energy was going. So I did a little investigation and I will bring you along on that journey today. Uh, trigger warning, if you're one of those people that sees a new tool and uh, just has to go out and buy it, I'm real sorry. I'm probably gonna pull out a bunch of tools you haven't seen yet on the channel. Let's get this cover off and dig in. Okay, let's take a quick tour of what we're actually seeing inside here. This is the input power, this comes in goes through the terminal strip. We've got a 15 amp circuit breaker, and then we've got a couple of contactors. And these contactors switch in for the different, to switch the power for the different clamping modes. The one here on the left, I believe, is for the um, light clamping that actually puts the magnet in series with a capacitor, so it uh, runs at low power. And then the second one here, KM2, is for the heavy clamping when you actually pull the leaf to do the switching. This is a 12 volt transformer that's used for the demagnetizing circuit because uh, when you press and hold the stop button, it actually runs uh, 12 volts DC backwards through the magnet to demagnetize it and help the load to release. We've got all the switches down here that go through to the front panel. This is a series capacitor that I believe, if I understand the schematic correctly, is what limits the current in the light clamping mode. This is the leaf switch that actually detects when you push on the leaf. And then we've got a few other things. These are the DC rectifiers. These are full wave rectifiers. This one is for the high power clamping and this is for the 12 volts DC for the release uh, current. And then we've got this board over here, which is, according to the manual and according to the manufacturer, what limits the current to the magnet uh, uh, during clamping that actually controls that, that should prevent it from drawing 17 amps. Um, and we'll look at, more de look at that in more detail. And then over here is the actual input to the magnet itself. The first and most obvious thing to check here is the magnet resistance. And the uh, manual says that the magnet should be uh, 28 ohms. So let me just go ahead and pull the wires out here. 
and let's just do a quick check of the resistance and make sure that it really is not just a problem with a shorted magnet or something that's causing that. And looks like we've got 28.2 ohms, which is exactly on spec. So it's definitely not a problem with the magnet. You'll note that since we have the panel open here and we're messing around inside, I have the tool unplugged for safety, but we can't do any more testing with it unplugged, so let me go plug it in. Okay, we've got that plugged in. Let me turn it on and uh, make sure that it really will still work. And it does. Now just as a sanity check, let's check the input voltage coming in here. I did this off camera last time, uh, but several people asked in the comments if maybe the excess current was just because I had the transformer hooked up backwards. But as you can see, there we go, 221.3 volts AC. And is there a DC component? Negligible. So we really, the buck transformer really is working. We've really got 221 volts. Let's measure the current here and see what we're actually getting. So set this to amps AC and we'll put this on the input line. Get this where you can read it and clamp. And there it is, 17.4 amps. Now this is an RMS meter, so this is an RMS current reading, not an average current reading. And that turns out to be important because the power factor on this device is pretty bad. In fact, let me illustrate that. I have a cheap Sentec meter here. This is not a true RMS meter, so this is just going to read average current. Let's clamp it on and see what we get. and 10.4 amps. So when I first noticed this, my first thought was, you gotta be kidding, did they really put an average current rating on the nameplate instead of RMS? It's a simple explanation, but I'm not totally sure that's what's going on. Because again, when I saw that, when I showed this information to the manufacturer, they again, weren't very concerned and, and didn't really think that anything was wrong. So let's dig into this just a little bit deeper. So we've got meters that disagree. So what do we do? Well, let's bring in a third party to arbitrate. So I've got my oscilloscope over here and I've got this set up with a high voltage differential voltage probe and a clamp on current probe. And let's take a look and see what the waveforms actually look like let this thing integrate the waveforms over the entire cycle and see what it says about RMS. Okay, I've got the probes hooked up here to measure the AC voltage that's ultimately gonna be going into the rectifier and I've got the current probe here on the AC input and I've got the scope configured with the correct, um, the correct ratio. So this is, I've got this in the times 500 mode so 500 volts here equates to one volt on the scope and the scope's gonna compensate for that automatically. And I have this set to the one millivolt per 100 milliamps and I have the trace set up for that as well. So the yellow trace is gonna be the AC voltage. The blue trace is the current. So let's turn this on. That's the light clamping mode. That's the heavy clamping mode. And let me stop this. Let's talk about what we are seeing here. Now, if you've ever wondered what a really terrible power factor looks like, this is a really terrible power factor. So we've got the AC waveform, and it's a little bit distorted. We'll talk about why in a minute. And then the blue down below is the current waveform. And you can see that what's happening is we're not drawing current smoothly throughout the AC cycle. In fact, the only time we're drawing current is right at the peak of the AC cycle just before it reaches the top. And this is why the RMS current is so different from the average current. The average current is relatively low, 
but because these current spikes are so high, we end up with uh, a really low power factor because the heating in the wires and in the transformer and in the coils, which would, be, uh, which would correspond to the square of the current, is actually gonna be a lot higher than you would get with the current that is average over this same period. So I'm not sure exactly what the Centec meter is reading, but it's close to average of you know, around 10 amps. But if we look at this waveform, the scope is saying that RMS, that is 16.9 amps. And let's see, can I make that bigger? Yes, I can. So we're seeing an RMS uh, current here of 16.9 amps, which is very similar to the 17.4. And in fact, the fluke might read that again if I did it now because the magnet has warmed up a little bit and the, the uh, resistance has probably increased slightly. Now, the reason why this is drawing current right before the peak, if you think about it, is because this has a full wave rectifier and a filtering capacitor. So what's happening is as this voltage rises, eventually it reaches the voltage, the current voltage of the filter cap, and then it charges it back up to the peak voltage again. And while it's charging that cap, you get a spike of current. And then once the capacitor is fully charged and the voltage of the AC waveform starts to go back down, well now the voltage of the AC waveform is lower than the voltage of the capacitor, so no current flows through the diode. And so your current usage drops off until we go negative and again it's full wave rectified so the DC, the rectified DC is going positive again. And as soon as it passes the current voltage of the cap, it draws current again. And so you see those current spikes drawn only near the peak of the waveform, just before the peak of the voltage waveform. And in fact, you can see the voltage dip in that waveform that's caused by that. So you get some distortion of the AC line. So if we take, uh, let's go look at the voltage that we're seeing there measured. Let me change the font size back down a little bit so we can get a couple more things on the display. And uh, there it is, RMS 218 volts on the AC waveform. So this is under the clamping load. There were some people that suggested, well, maybe just the voltage drop will be sufficient when, the, when this thing is under load to bring it into spec. We went from a measured 221, granted with a different instrument, to 218 under load. So the voltage sag is not much. And I'm running this on about 20 feet of 12 gauge wire for the power cable. So I think this gives us an idea of exactly what is going on here and why our two meters read so radically different. Now, if this were just a simple story of, oh, the manufacturer just put the average current on the nameplate and not the RMS, then it's mystery solved. I'm not totally convinced that that's what's going on. Um, I wanted to look into this a little bit deeper and we've got some replacement parts that we can swap in here. Um, let me try one other test first, just to see uh, if we can see what might be happening to that extra energy. So an extra seven and a half amps at 220 volts is what, about 1500 watts that's going somewhere. And so if there's something wrong, if there's a defective component on the board, it's a pretty good chance something is getting hot. So a good tool to diagnose that is a thermal camera. And I've got one right here. Um, I actually went out and bought it for this project because it was the perfect excuse. And if you've ever wondered if you should have a, ter a thermal camera, mm, I'll tell you, I was playing around with this, walking around my house, and discovered that the electric kettle in my kitchen had a bad power cord. And just boiling a couple liters of water, it was reaching temperatures well over 100 degrees Celsius on the power cord itself. And when I went in and looked a little closer, discovered there was some blistering on the outlet, I probably saved myself from a kitchen fire with this thing. So that paid for itself already. But let's take a look at what we've got going on here in the control panels. This has been off for a little bit and cooling down. And so we can see sort of where we are with residual heat. And there's kind of not a lot in here. The board over here is fairly warm. This is the uh, capacitor, the main rectifier capacitor, and you can see the thyristor there, but we're talking about, what, 32 degrees Celsius, so what about body temperature? So there's nothing really hot in here. Let's power it up and see what happens. Okay, so I've got this on full clamping mode, and we're just kind of looking around. So over here are the power input wires, 
and the terminal strips. You can see there's a little bit of heat there, not a ton. Uh, coming over and looking at the contactors and the transformer, there's not much there. There are the wires to the power switch. There's a little bit of heat there. But again, we're talking, you know, 40 degrees Celsius or less. And then up here on the circuit board, you can see that the thyristor is warming up. But we're still talking about maybe 41, 42 degrees Celsius. That's not 1500 watts being dissipated. And then moving over here, we can see the rectifier. And that rectifier is reaching, what, 51, 52 degrees Celsius. And this thing only has a 30% duty cycle, so I'm pushing it pretty hard by just leaving it clamped with no material in it right now. And, you know, we are seeing some temperatures, but not, not much, you know, 50, 60 degrees with a long extended clamp time. I just don't see anything there that concerns me. Let's see, what are we actually running on these wires? Yeah, 40 degrees Celsius. That's, that's nothing. So I'm not really seeing anything here that I'm particularly concerned about. The components that are actually handling all the current are the components that are getting warm, but not too hot. So I don't think this solves our mystery. Got a little care package in the mail from Bailey. I've got a replacement circuit board here. And again, I don't have any reason to believe there's anything wrong with this one, but they just sent this over to try just in case. And I've got a replacement rectifier. And again, we didn't see anything there that looked weird, but uh, we'll go ahead and swap these parts in and see if it makes any difference. Now I've taken photos of everything here just to make sure that uh, I know what's going on. You can see that I have the power unplugged and uh, I'll go ahead and switch that off. I've got the power switch off um, and I will do a little bit of checking in here just to make sure we don't have any residual voltage on capacitors before I dive in too far. Make sure the power really is off. And yeah, it really is off. And I've got the breaker off and I've got the switch off and I've got the plug right here where you can see it so you won't get scared. Okay. Let me dig in here. I would like to measure this capacitor. I did go over this board and measured all the components on the new one. They all look good as far as I can tell. The soldering on the back was probably okay. I didn't like the way it looked, so I touched up the joint, fluxed them, touched up the joints, and then cleaned the board. But I'm pretty confident that everything on this board is good. We'll swap it in and see if there's any difference. If there is, then we'll dig in further and try to figure out what's going on with the old board. If there isn't, then I guess we haven't learned anything. Now, the one component I couldn't test was this series capacitor because, of course, it's not on the new board. We're going to reuse it. So I'm going to go ahead and pull out the wires for that first. And I want to just test that capacitor and see if it seems reasonable. So what I have here is an LCR meter, and we can measure the capacitance of this capacitor, and we can also measure the equivalent series resistance. There we go. 18.4, this is supposed to be, I believe, 18 microfarad, is that what it says? Yeah, 18 microfarad, and we're seeing 18.4, and let's look. at the ESR, ESR 0 0.03 ohms at one kilohertz. We're actually running this probably at 120 hertz. So let's look at that. Yeah, ESR is basically zero as far as this meter can read and it's 18, yeah, 18 microfarads. So that all looks fine, that capacitor is good. Okay, well, we've got the new rectifier in, we've got the new control board in, or the current limiting board. Let's power this thing back up and see what happens. Any bets? Okay, let me just make sure it works. It 
Sounds the same to me. So let's take a current reading and see what happens. Light clamping, 1.3 amps, and full clamping, 17.7. So 17.6, 17.5 as the magnet starts to warm up. So I'm seeing nothing. There's 17.4, exactly what we saw before. So it looks like this is normal. I don't know. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, we know that it's not this board. Tested this capacitor, it's good. And the rectifier we've replaced, and you know, I tested it, it's the new, the new one, it's good. We could go through and test the old components, but we're getting exactly the same behavior from the new ones. So the only conclusion that I can really draw from this is that this is normal. This thing really does draw 17 amps. Why does the nameplate say 10? The manufact why is the manufacturer quote 10 to 12? I really don't know. If you've got one of these, you know, if anybody out there's got one of these, I would love it if you would throw a clamp on it and actually see how much current it's really drawing. Because I'm very curious to see if this is unique, but we've tested the magnet. The magnet um, has the right resistance. All the components in here I've tested good plus we've replaced them and it's still doing the same thing. So if you've got one of these, please throw a clamp meter on it and uh, post down in the comments what you're getting for uh, current readings on yours. And make sure you identify what meter model you use to take the measurement. Because like I said, a true RMS meter is showing 17.4 amps and so is the scope and the scope probe. So we know that's what's really there. But in terms of uh, you know cheap uh, meters, you know stuff you get from Harbor Freight or stuff that's not true RMS rated, that's going to show a lower, a lower current. Did the manufacturer here really rate this based on average current? I don't know. It looks like it, but, uh, you know, I don't really, I don't really know. So if you've got opinions on that, throw those down in the comments. If you've got one of these, please measure it. I would love to know if this is normal or not, but at this point, it's working fine. The manufacturer has been made aware of it. The thing is, is uh, well documented. So if I end up with some kind of a problem in the future, I'm sure they'll take care of me. But for now, I think I'm just going to use the brake. Well, that's all I have for you today. Like I said, this was a little bit of an odyssey that I went down uh, learning about this and trying to understand what was happening. And unfortunately, we still have a mystery. It sure looks like everything's working fine. But that's all I've got for you today. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.